Okay, so I think we can get started. So first of all, thank you everyone for joining our panel discussion. And today our topic is about global and regional open source adoption and participation in the era of AI. And I'll be guiding our conversation today. And I'm Yaya from Angular Oswo. And before this, I was a PhD focusing, uh, focusing on open source ecosystem uh, sustainability. And um, also I'm a member of the Chaos community. Um, today we have Annie, Richard, and Willem to join our panel. So how about we each have a brief introduction of ourselves? Okay, great. Thank you, Yaya. I'll start. Can everybody see me? Is it on? I don't think it's on. Okay. Is it? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, welcome. Hi, my name is Annie Lai. Uh, just a quick introduction about myself. Um, I'm currently the chair of Generative AI Commons, and also I sit on um, the advisory board uh, of LF Europe. Um, before that, I sat on various boards such as CNCF, OpenStack Foundation, um, um, Edge, LF Edge, and OSI. And I've been uh, doing developer relationship uh, relation work for quite a bit. My first job was um, I was a technology evangelist at Sun Microsystems. I guess I'm showing my age. <laughs> That's when I fell in love with developer relations. And I've traveled over like 35 countries, five continents, meeting developers all over the world. And um, I really enjoy what I do. And uh, just a you know a funny story is a true story. I remember we went to Egypt. And, you know, we try to have fun after the sessions and we try to do some sort of tour. So we did a camel ride and my boss at the time said, oh, yeah, just expensive as transportation. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really fun. Um, um, lovely meeting you all. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Bien. Uh, I work for Ant Group Open Source Program Office, which I personally founded back in 2021. So I'm an engineer by training. Another uh, label I typically put on myself is I'm a global citizen. Uh, I had my high school in Singapore and university in Toronto, Canada. I spent like 11 years in the States before I returned back to China and work on my current role. Yeah, so um, I uh, basically another job I'm doing is I'm also working with uh, AN Data as outreach chair. Yeah, so very glad to be here. And um, given that I've been at so many different locations, I think the topic we have here today really kind of strikes me. So I guess um, today we're going to be focusing on some of the discussions in terms of uh, how we can actually facilitate um, the adoption and uh, participation in open source at different geolocations, which given the job and uh, my experiences, I kind of feel that it's a topic which interests me the most. And I do hope that you know, we can, we're able to get more developers to join our course. Thank you. Um, hi, I, everyone. My name is William Jiang, and uh, I have been uh, in open source industry for a very long time, just like uh, I need to count uh, more than <laughs> it's like uh, more than uh, a decade. Um, for my experiences, like uh, I, I'm joined open source as uh, um, engineer and uh, from China. And uh, uh, at that time, so I get the uh, chance to uh, join the Apache project, and uh, then I work for uh, Red Hat, and then I. I, uh, it's like uh, I, um, my career path is like uh, I go through the Apache's uh, uh, stage, just like uh, from a committer to the PMC member and then uh, as a member. And uh, uh, recent, uh, the recent three years, I'm a service uh, board director and uh, in SF. Um, oh, oh, my, my, my daily job is like uh, I'm working out uh, by Dyn uh since last year. And uh, it's really a challenge for us to to build the open source culture and uh, to adapt the open source ways. And uh, this is uh, my first time to join the uh, Open Source Summit uh, EU. And uh, it's really a many experience to see you guys. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to exchange more interesting ideas and seek for the uh, collaborations uh, with you guys. Yeah, thanks for the intro. So before we get started, I wish to quote some numbers from GitHub October 2022 and 2023. And 
uh, the October, <laughs> sorry, um, for this year should be on its way because it will be published uh, in every October, so it should be published next month. And the figure in the lab to demonstrate the top 20 countries with the most new developers outside the U.S. So we can see that most, more, more than 2.5 million new people in India joined GitHub in 2022, followed by China with uh, 1.2 uh, million people. And um, if we look into the Asia Pacific developer growth from the table in the right, we can see that uh, countries and regions in the Asia Pacific saw some of the highest growth with uh, Hong Kong leading the largest percentage. And this is a top 10 developers communities trends on GitHub for the past five years that we can see that Asia Pacific, Africa, uh, South America and Europe are getting bigger year over year with India, Brazil and Japan among those leading the pack. So my first question goes to Annie. Um, but Richard and William, just feel free to um, jump in with your thoughts. Yeah. Hi again. Yeah, because from your uh, view of um, the natural th third party organization as general generative AI comments, could you provide an overview of global open source ecosystem and per uh, e e global open source adoption participation? How uh, have you seen this vary by region? Yeah, I, I think uh, overall global you know, open source adoption and participation have been increasing due to number one, technology, the software technology is getting more and more mature. I think there's a statistic that says 97% of enterprises are using some sort of open source software. Everybody pretty much is using Linux and, um, and Git. <laughs> so, um, and then also there's more and more developers now um, than, you know, when I was a te technology evangelist, um, you know, a long time ago. And also more and more enterprises are um, considering open source as a very strategic to them. So with all these factors, um, there's no doubt that open source is here to stay. Um, um, from from a, each region's perspective, US obviously, and you know, Canada, right? The pioneer of open source, right? From all the way back from the 60s. And and um, and then also US, you haven't heard of Silicon Valley, right? We got, there's a lot of VC monies supporting all these um, open source startups with creative business models. And um, so, and, and then you have companies like Google, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft, um, Red Hat, these guys are leading open source. And so with, with so US is, has a real, US and Canada has got really good environment in open source projects. In Europe, um, especially recently, there's a huge emphasis on digital sovereignty because the European countries, they don't want to be beholden by those, you know, big techs from other regions. So open source creates the lower barrier to entry for them to develop their own IP. Um, so, and also um, the government is strongly supporting open source. Government has offered a lot of grants for open source projects um, to, you know, grow. And, and then also, this is my personal observation. Um, obviously I'm generalizing and uh, I went to FOSTEM this year and I was just so amazed by the passion of, you know, the open source developers there. And my, my personal observation is that the European developers, they are truly passionate about what they do in open source. So their projects sometimes could be really small, but they're very passionate about it. And whereas US, most of the open source developers got supported by, you know, their own employers, right? And Asia Pacific obviously is the fastest growing region. And obviously it's due to their vast amount of developers. They are, you know, um, growing every year. And India, China, huge, right? And so, and then there's also Latin America. I was surprised to see Brazil was up there too. So, so, and also Middle East, I mean, with AI coming, you know, we are truly expanding the open source community. Like, you know, Middle East, um, there's a Falcon Foundation and supporting AI. And, um, and in Africa, you, um, you know, you all heard about like um, the speed, uh, a few sessions um, given by United Nation. They're talking about bridging the digital gap and uh, the global majority, we'll call it global majority. Open source creates the uh, really good um, uh, channel for them to develop their technologies. So 
Um, I think open source is definitely, we are, you know, we are definitely growing fast and uh, we just need to create more and more processes to help, um, you know, to help support the growth. Uh, maybe I'll just add a quick line on that one. Uh, and the entry mentioned a lot of the geolocation differences. Uh, I think one observation I had, especially last year, is uh, anti-fragility of open source is really there. Um, because that group actually invests a lot in cloud native. So we've been having our internal discussions in the past two years. It's like, hey, is cloud native getting old? It's like, what are we going to do with all the AI stuff? And so like, people begin worrying about it. But like, you know, this year during the KubeCon Hong Kong, so we, we really begin seeing that, you know, when people begin dealing with all the AI workloads, Kubernetes is probably the product which is going to evolve the fastest and it's going to be here to stay. And that really strikes me as um, uh, if we kind of look at all the, well, we just talk about Linux. Linux has been here for a long time. And we saw Linux in Hong Kong, we saw Linux here. He's, he's here to stay, as he mentioned, he wants to be keep developing, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I really kind of began having a sense of feeling about, uh, about having a global community behind a project, the power and the, uh, I would say the continuation and the sustainability of the open source project is really immensely, I would say, hard to imagine. Yeah. So William, do you uh, want to add on something based on your Oh, I, I can add some things I'm, uh, from my observations from the Apache Software Foundation's level. It's like uh, there's a lot of uh, projects that come from China and uh, uh, since the pandemic. Um, I, I think it's hard to uh, uh, have the face-to-face -face meeting, but in China we have uh, set up the local community and uh, we host the meetup and uh, suddenly uh, there's a lot of uh, projects come from China. And in, in, in the meantime, it's like uh, uh, um, we, we are still in the early stage. It's like uh, uh, there's a lot of developers who are interested about uh, sharing their experience. It it's could be the hobby project, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's really uh, bring the value to the to the whole community and uh, some from and the group, I, I, I think. And uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, that that uh, could be a very interesting. Um, um, uh, observa observation. It's like uh, we are trying to do some innovations uh, in open source way. Even we are a little bit uh, behind the schedule, but uh, it's like uh, we are trying to catch up. Yes, and things all of us sitting here has some connection with Asia. We, I think we can dive a bit deep, deeper into the regional uh, open source uh, participation. So um, like Asia in particular are facing some um, unique challenges in open source participation. So what do you think are some of the uh, key challenges that Asia encounters compared to other regions? Oh, if you guys uh, joined the uh, uh, sessions uh, two days ago, uh, pretty much a similar times, so uh, uh, Daniel and I uh, share uh, some con uh, cultural uh, uh, difference uh, between the uh, East and Western uh, countries and uh, we do some comparisons to the open source culture. And uh, I think the uh, most challenging part is like uh, um, uh, um, there are some uh, language barrier, uh, um, but uh, with the help of AI, I, I think uh, uh, it, it is quite easier to overcome. But another part is like uh, cultural, cu cultural things. And uh, uh, for me, um, the, the unique experience is uh, quite different because uh, as an individual, uh, when I joined the uh, open source developers, I have to go that way because uh, uh, some of my colleagues uh, are living in, in Europe and uh, some living in the US. I have to use the email to talk to them. I, I don't have any other options to choose, but if I work with a bunch of Chinese, they are sitting together. It's like uh, I try to avoid the, the, the private conversations. I, I know the transparency is quite good, but it's like I have to phone back uh, to the uh, Chinese uh, culture, and uh, which bring me to think uh, if there's a uh, good ways to uh, do some bridge, and uh, um, that's is the another reasons I try to run the uh, uh, elections of the uh, uh, Apache Software Foundation's board. Uh, it's like uh, I, I I try to bring my some observations and I try to 
bring my some uh, uh, insights to the uh, to the board to help us to uh, be the bridge and uh, um, the um, bring to the key part is like uh, um, uh, those are some uh, detail things I can share, but uh, 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 the, the the key part is like uh, uh, in the cyberspace, it's really hard for us to build the trust, build the connections, and uh, in in China, China is like a more um, 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 uh, even it's uh, in a. Uh, New world is like uh, uh, we, we we still um, uh, come from the uh, agriculture. Uh, we we are seeing uh, touch to the land, and the people are know each other. So, and uh, this trust is quite uh, uh, unique for the uh, collaboration. And uh, how to uh, bridge these kind of things is uh, really uh, challenge. And uh, fortunately, we have a lot of conference, and uh, I I think any also uh, host uh, the GoSem and. The, well, yeah, <laughs> bring a lot of things, and I'm trying to hold the Apache Con Asia. So it's like uh, um, try to bring this kind of uh, opportunity to let the people together and uh, to um, help us to um, bring ideas uh, come true and uh, build the community, a local community, and uh, th that's pretty much I I want to share, and uh, I can give it to Bishop. Yeah, um, it's a it's a heavy topic because the moment I heard that question, it kind of reminds me of when I came back to China uh, a couple of years ago. There was this reverse cultural shock, which was just like overwhelming. I was like, dude, I'm Chinese, and uh, what's going on here? Um, yeah, so I think there are at least like three issues which I observed, which are going to be the barrier and so-called problems. Uh, the first thing is it's kind of interesting. I mentioned Apache. I think one of the difficulty which I encountered is um, in Asian cultures is probably most of the time code over community rather than community over code. It has something to do with like people. Are working really hard. I mean, like, when they're striking to the community and the first thing they're thinking about, hey, I need to get my job done. You know, like, it's either my leaders or, you know, like, I kind of feel very strongly that I have this urge to merge this PR. How do I merge it? I don't care. I just want to get that, that PR to be merged. It's good code, so don't argue with me. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but I mean, sometimes when people begin doing that, it becomes, like, a little bit difficult um, because, I mean, like, so for a company like Bytons or Ant Group, we have this, like, massive scale. Right, so like um, the number of servers and like essentially the number of instances we're running is pretty huge. So a lot of times when actually, especially when we're working on the foundation and infra projects, you do require some, I would say, due diligence and chat with community because when community was actually building the project, they're not really trying to cohere the project in such a way to deal with all of these kind of mass scales. But I mean, like when I deal with mass scales, you know, when you're trying to merge PR like that, it requires a lot of community engagement. Uh, but you know, people are not so used to it. So that's, I would say, the most uh, striking observation I had when we see people working in the community. And the second part is about the, I would say, the craftsman or the skills of working in a community. Uh, I think as we chat yesterday, William put it in a very nice way, is the ability to build connections in cyberspace. It's not coming in for free. I mean, like we are all like, you know, carbon animals, we're not silicon, right? So like, you know, the, the cyberspace is not something which is natural to me, at least. Um, and when we grow up, you know, we spend most of our time, you know, building kind of, you know, offline communities and people talking to each other, we get familiar first, you know, like, there was actually a joke that, you know, like in China, they're saying, how, how do you actually want to get along with people? Just go barbecue with him <laughs> and life will be good. You know, like, uh, if one time is not enough, make it two and they'll be good. <laughs> but I mean, like, um, so when we actually come to cyberspace, being able to make that connection as the first thing, you know, like, because I've never seen you, so that gentleman, I've never seen you. If the first thing I'm doing is send you an email, the connection is not already there. Um, so how can I actually provide the skill set? And uh, I would say the trainings, the Bibles, uh, the cookbook, a lot of things are just like simply missing there. It's a long topic. But um, how can I actually, you know, fill in the gap and by bringing all of those information there to get those people well educated before they hit the community is, um, I would say, the second difficulty. The last part is really, I think there is actually something related to the cultural. Um, it's less about language. Of course, you know, like language uh, for most of the Asian countries, English is not the first language. And for most of the countries, I mean, I remember I was in Korea last week. It was really difficult. <laughs> it's like, uh, I mean, at the Chinese, I don't really know where to go because there's just no English and it's all Korean everywhere. Um, 
Yeah, so like people are not really used to the fact that you might have like multicultural um, situation to deal with in uh, your day-to-day -day life. And um, it's interesting that William mentioned about the agricultural aspect. Um, so like, you know, the most of the Asian countries like very agricultural centric. It's kind of different from the industrial uh, culture in one major way is there's no supply chain. So the digital supply chain is a foreign idea um, to such a culture. And everything else is basically aftermath of that. So if you have supply chain, you pretty much need to work with upstream and downstream by nature. And you want the upstream to be successful. You don't want that to be gone. But for agriculture, um, kind of like culture is more like, hey, you know, I'm my land. And my neighbor has his land or her land. And, you know, we've been sitting together for this all time. And um, uh, we need to know each other well. And we need to collaborate and, you know, kind of pretty much, you know, build this kind of offline community. Um, yeah, I would say uh, those three things are probably the difficulties which I've been observing so far. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, excellent points from uh, William and, and, and Richard. I just want to add to it. Um, so, um, you know, obviously you said we're building relationships over the cyberspace. And I do think it's, there's a lot, still a lot of value to me in person, um, especially, you know, if there's a language issue. But when you meet in person, it doesn't matter how good or bad your English is. You can just communicate very effectively, a lot more effectively, right, over Zoom. So, so there's definitely value for in-person conferences that's why we're here and so uh, one barrier for uh, the china market or uh, asia pacific is visa a lot of, uh, visa and then for us right now is funding like budget companies don't have budget to send their employees everywhere and so this is why i help organize this thing called GoSim. since you brought it up it's called global open source innovation meetup we kind of model after fostem but fostem only focuses on europe so this is for to help support grassroots open source projects you know people get together discuss and collaborate and we actually welcome people travel to other region like the first one we did was in shanghai we co-loaded with coupon and second one we did it in Delft, uh, Netherlands, we colored it with Rust NL. And the third one is coming up in Beijing. And, and so uh, I think we are having like oh, probably over 35, you know, non-Chinese speakers flying over there. And we also want to make sure we have fun. So, so this is kind of a moving conference that, you know, uh, organized by volunteers, it's nonprofit. So check out gosim.org. So check out GoSim. And it's just an attempt to foster, you know, the in-person um, collaboration. So I, I think um, that would be very, you know, having more, more in-person collaboration, coming to conferences like that, it really helps. Thank you. I really love the, yes, I really love those examples and cases you mentioned um, when um, regarding the culture and uh, looking at the broader open source community to integrate different regions um, to, to have more engagement is no small, um, no small task. And so this question is um, for um, Richard and William as the head of OSPOs of N Group and ByteDance. So what are um, the, like, how do these challenges you mentioned influence your OSPO strategy? And what are the, uh, like, practices that could help to tackle these challenges to better integrate with the global open source ecosystem? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it's really a hard uh, to uh, start from scratch. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, obstacles you need to overcome. And uh, um, yeah, to, to share my journey, it's like uh, um, we uh, just uh, uh, started our OSPO um, uh, three years ago, and I joined by last, uh, last year. And uh, uh, I, I think the most uh, 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 Chinese engineer is quite, uh, um, how to say that, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> spend a lot of time. Uh, hard. Yeah, yeah, diligence, work hard, and uh, they spend a lot of time on the code. And, uh, but uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, as Richard mentioned, um, they may spend too much time on their own code. And sometimes uh, uh, it's like, uh, oh, it's open source, and we can borrow some ideas, and we can borrow the code. To our field, it's like uh, we can do a lot of, um, uh, we call it uh, modification and uh, a lot. So that's bring on another thing. So it's hard to you to bring it back to the upstream. And uh, when I work for Red Hat, it's like uh, 
it's uh, by nature. You, you, when you made some things uh, on the downstream, uh, it, it's not okay, and you are not finish your job. You need to uh, uh, go back to the upstream and uh, make sure this patch is in the latest version, and then we, we are good. We, we don't need to spend a lot of time to maintain our internal branch. But for the Chinese uh, developers, uh, they may think, um, oh, I, I, I got uh, good foundations already, and I can do what I want. But you, you, you made a very big mistake. You, you, you cannot always keep updated. So, so, so doing this uh, mindset trend is really a challenge for me right now. And, uh, um, and I think uh, once I can uh, bring uh, the people to know better about upstream first, and then I can go on the next level to bring more open source projects to the, to the com community. So, so I'm in a very pain stage. So if you guys have any good suggestions, ideas, please talk to me. And uh, I'm happy to bring these things to back to my company, and uh, it will help us a lot. Well, I mean, as an engineer, I start with index zero, so zero, uh, have a um, Being able to have a hospital will essentially help you with one thing is to pretty much land and build that, you know, like the, it's, it's basically like the trailblazer, right? So hospital is like a trailblazer. We go into the West, you know, like we, we're going towards like San Francisco without knowing if there's gold there. Um, but, you, you know, you got to put that pass out so that people will trust you. They will have a way to follow you. Um, and then, I would say there are like three things which I kind of personally found to be really beneficial. Uh, the first one is um, definitely having a strategy. Um, but that, that line is very easy to say, but in reality, it's pretty hard. I mean, like, what do you mean by strategy when my next OKR is only six months away? Right? Everything is like open source related is like pretty long term. So the, the way I'm kind of figuring out is like you need to do both top down and bottom up. So I actually like I interviewed about like 100 plus people uh, for my first year I was working at OSPO internally. Um, there are like 30 project leaders um, and they're all having different needs and I pretty much spend time and they all look at me as us. So they, you know the first time I go to them they're pretty much sitting there and say, so how can it be helpful for me? <laughs> oh, sorry. Sure, <laughs> listen to me then. Uh, yeah, so it's, it definitely takes a long time for them to be able to, first of all, comprehensively understand what open source is, has something to do with the difficulties we mentioned. Um, but toward the end of the day, you know, like I always ask for one thing. So uh, given that we had a pretty good conversation on a certain trust level, would you mind to maybe set up a strategy for what you want to do with your project? It can be a very, I would say, marketing oriented one. It can be a very techy, savvy one. I don't care. I just want one. Um, yeah, and then the second part is to pretty much like you know um, be aligning with your business goal um, to some ex to some degree overfitting um, because the business goal in most of the Chinese companies, um, I have to say, a little bit short uh, short sighted uh, due to the fierce competitive nature of the of the market, especially the business to business market. So you do see people do sh shift a lot. You know, like for instance, this year we're kind of saying, hey, we go past first. Next year it's like SaaS is the way to go. Pass SaaS, pass SaaS. It just happens. Um, and you know, if um, so for us, Paul, it's very easy for us falling into the trap for say, hey, you know, this is a, the golden desire for you to do it this way. Um, but if you keep saying that you will lose your audience. So um, basically what, I, what my personal experience is really just like, you know, it's okay, just be overfitting, it's like, but when you do the overfitting part, fill in the void, right? Just like, you know, this is his line and I'm going to be expanding that into a cone shape and I'm going to tweak the leader to a little bit towards the direction which I want him to go. Um, and it has been working pretty well for me, uh, interesting enough. But you need to actually, you know, sit down with them, speak their language, and understand the aspect that, you know, business is business and open source is not going to be generating money for you directly. Uh, last but not least, um, be global. Um, in fact, I mean, uh, this is the fourth year of Andrew Bospo, but it's probably the first year. I mean, this is my first EU event ever. It's only my second time in Europe. Uh, how so is because we only begin having OKR about going global this year. And the reason for that is because we have CTO from Google. And we didn't have a CTO from Google, we have CTO local uh, last year. So, no, 
have your finger crossed. Sometimes, you know, it's not you, it's really the macro. Um, but make sure that you do grab the opportunities when the opportunity actually presents itself. Um, like, so for us, it's like, you know, we are really trying to, so basically CIA and us, so we're really trying to be present, connect with people, uh, be the trailblazer, as we mentioned, to bring information back or fit into their business model and then set a strategy. So that pretty much completes the pass. Thank you. So with the rise of AI, as what is written in our slides, we are living in the era of AI. So what are the key shifts you've observed in terms of um, processes, uh, tools, uh, collaboration models, or even responsibilities of OSPOs and also open source initiatives like gener generative AI commons? Okay. Me? Okay. So um, obviously, you know, we're moving to the era, AI era, right? OSPOs also, OSPOs also have to evolve. Um, number one, the open source community, the composition of open source community is going to be different. One example, the traditional open source developers, you know, obviously we still need them, but in addition to that, you know, we need data scientists and, um, and also the, the workflow is going to be different. The decision making is different. Stakeholder, business stakeholders are going to be different. And so, so we need to evolve to incorporate, to be more inclusive and have a diverse audience um, for OSPO. And also um, from a process standpoint, and you know, obviously now AI is very much, well, people say the, the, you know, data is the new code in the AI era, right? So data is very important. And when you talk about data, you have to think about security, privacy, uh, data quality in order to make sure that the AI models are really uh, trained based on what you're looking, uh, you what you're looking for. Um, so, so that pro so the OSPOS process also need, it needs to include data part of the process. And um, and then you know and and the the third area is um, ethics. You know, when we talk about AI ethics, bias, those kind of things, we need to think about being aligned with human needs, societal needs. And we also need to incorporate that into the OSPO process. Yeah, um, I, I think I have two things to share. Uh, well, actually, before that, uh, I would say kudos to actually the uh, general comments work on model openness framework. Um, I guess one thing which we kind of realized for um, the AI era of open source the problem with that is like we don't even know what open source means in the Jiang era. So yeah, I, I, Stefano had a talk like two days ago and Jiang Economics is working on model openness framework. I think there will be a lot of, um, I would say, ongoing discussions um, way before we're reaching the consensus. So I would say that part is definitely important. So um, to add on to that, I think there are, uh, from OSPO's perspective, there are actually two, two things which I highly recommend. One. Um, know your audience. Um, so when we're actually, you know, being the OSPO, we know that we're serving both internally and externally, but primarily internally, um, because you do need sponsors. But when you think about sponsors, again, it's top down, bottom up, and the top layer will not change much, but the bottom layer is shifting drastically. So I will probably throw a question out, is like, what's the definition of developer in the Gen AI era? Is that still going to be people writing code? What about the data scientists, right? So what about the designers who can actually write very elegant prompts, which can really get your friend and in no time? So the audience of um, OSPO, I would say in Gen AI era is going to be expanding. Um, and it just means that we're serving more, I would say it's a, a more like a heterogeneous uh, audience group at this moment. And you um, back to the part in which you were doing the interview. We we'll probably need to do more interviews and really trying to understand what they're trying to do. Um, and while this whole thing evolving, uh, trying to work with them and really understand how to get them kind of back to this, right? How to get them adapt and participate uh, in the existing models, right? So the data scientist can write models and uh, whereas everyone else might be able to become the user of open source for the first time in their lifetime. So we can definitely do something about it. Um, and then the second aspect of OSPO is when I'm actually thinking about OSPO, we're thinking about um, essentially this, um, this team, which can be big or small, but uh, the team is actually serving the company. How can we do so? We typically have tools, utilities, and uh, products, which is going to be serving this whole thing. That said, we do know the term of MVP equals to most uh, minimum viable product. 
Um, but I've been reading a book in which, you know, they kind of discuss about anything related to a product. There has been a prerequisite for that, which is also another MVP. It's called minimum valuable process. So you got to build that process in order to condense that into a product, which will make that to be useful. And the process is something which OSPO folks are really good at. So I would um, probably um, make a vouch for uh, all the OSPO owners or practitioners to pay close attention to how this process will evolve. Uh, internally has been changing us a lot. Now we begin having a different process for open data, a different process for open science. And we're kind of making more connections between the paper application process to open source application process. We're actually promoting more paper to be open sourced. So a lot of those are actually changing and it's fastly evolving. I would say it's a good opportunity for the OSPO folks to actually step in and fill in the void and be adaptive. Just one more thing. Since you brought up Gen AI Commons, I have to, you know, do another plug. <laughs> GENcommons.org. Okay, it's a non-membership community. To our mission is to um, help foster the uh, collaboration advancement of generative AI via open source via science. And Gen AI Commons is under LFAI and data. Anybody in the world is welcome. And even if you are a beginner in the AI space. You know, you can still dial in, listen, and learn. We have like speakers from various um, areas of Gen AI, and it's a good place to learn, good place to you know participate and contribute. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, and uh, <laughs> and uh, Richard. And uh, what I want to add is like uh, um, as an engineer, I I think it's in a more uh, uh, practical way. It's like how can I use the AI is to help my daily job. It's like uh, we are short of a hand in the OSPO perspectives, especially there's a lot of uh, chat related work I need to do in my daily job. So now I'm focused on bringing the knowledge um, uh, to, to the boat level. And uh, I, I, I did some uh, interesting tests. It's like uh, I, I put the uh, LF uh, OSPO uh, a white paper into the uh, the both platforms, uh, which is come from bad as uh, cause uh, uh, coast, and uh, uh, as a knowledge, and uh, it suddenly can talk in different language, <laughs> English, Chinese, and uh, even Spanish. And but but the interesting part is like uh, as a, uh, a community we have a lot of mentorship. It's like uh, we, if we want to build a welcome uh, community, it's like we, we, are, uh, we always answer the questions from the uh, newbies. And uh, I, I think this is a quite uh, good way for us to build the trust, to, to get connections. And uh, with a little bit of help of AI, that could do could could help us to uh, 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 fill in the, uh, the, the gap of the knowledge. And uh, I, I think the most important thing is, you know, open source community, like uh, we share, share everything, so share, share the knowledge and for the new new guys who just come in, he can know the context, the, the, uh, even, even the discussions uh, maybe years ago by looking up the uh, mailing list. But uh, uh, with the AI, we can do these kind of things more easily. With the general AI, we can uh, um, produce the content as, as neat. So, so for me, um, uh, look at the OSPO is like uh, we uh, um, provide uh, some kind of service to educate people to know how to do the work in you know, a more open source friendly way. And then this is a quite a unique uh, position and uh, I just want to use the AI to help me to do this kind of thing. I actually prepared for another question, the last question, but we are running out of time. We we'll, we also have one minute, so I want to open up for questions. So, do you have any question? Experience, what measures can be taken to, to uh, bring the psychological safety into the project? 
Yeah, um, I, I think the talk was Hillary you said about this. Um, um, I think one of the things in which we can do is ask questions, ask clarification, ask clarification questions. There has been saying that uh, about having the capability to ask questions is probably one of the most important skill when Gen AI comes. But my feeling is it has been an important skill all day long. Yeah, like, you know, being able to ask questions and clarify things is important. Um, I personally have been experiencing a lot of situations in which, you know, like um, asking a rhetorical question about, hey, you know, it seems that you're trying, really trying to merge this PR as soon as possible, but I have this concern one, two, three. What's your take on this? Without being able to clarify these issues, without being able to move forward, you know, just kind of toss it, toss the question back and ask them, what's, you know, what's your proposition? Are you under a particular deadline? But, you know, William has a very nice way of saying that your deadline is not my deadline. <laughs> well, we don't put that line in the PR, but yeah, we can, we can pretty much say that you apply with asking question back. I can't answer. I think Asia Pac, my observation is government is very much involved. In fact, um, you know, because like I said, US is the pioneer in open source, right? And other regions are trying to catch up. So a lot of times when they try to catch up and you know, government consider open source is the lowest barrier to entry to acquire technology. So a lot of times government is actually very supportive. Um, and yeah, do you have anything else to add? Um, yeah, um, I mean, I think it's really case by case because I mean, when, uh, so for instance, when we say Southeast Asia, it's like 10 different type of you know, <laughs> sovereign parties. Um, uh, I guess like one thing which I personally observed is um, it's going to require a lot of public and private sector collaboration to get this right. That, that's, that's basically my, my, rule, my golden rule. Um, it's impossible for the open source community to just evolve by itself in Asia. Um, as freely as you know, we can have that in the in the states. So we do need the support from government uh, in many different ways. Maybe through policies, through like essentially incentivized programs. And um, as far as I know, there has been several trial experimentations in China at this moment, which seems to be so far so good. Um, I mean, we're learning. Yeah. And I also want to add, since we're entering the AI era, right? Policymakers from all over the world, they all get trying to get involved, US, Europe, and Asia PAC as well, because AI is definitely going to change the way, you know, our society is, right? Social media already makes a huge difference, and AI is going to make an even bigger difference. So, yeah, regulations, policymakers, involvement, um, definitely you can count on that. But um, for Asia, I, I do think um, there's more and more grassroots happening as well, right, in addition to the government led. So, um, do you guys want to talk about? Do you want to talk about the grassroots since you are more involved in Apache, uh, like uh, you know, Kai Yuan Shu, right? It's pretty much. Very oh good. yeah, um, I think there's a lot of engineer who talent engineer. They have very, very good, great ideas, and uh, they just want to practice this in an uh, open source way, and uh, they get a lot of attentions from by sharing their projects uh, online. And I think that could be a very good way to 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 help uh, to, to first to facilitate those kind of things and uh, from the government part it's like uh, I, I think um, more and more people know about the open source and uh, also um, I, I think you has also and the uh, university had also and uh, it's and uh, um, more collaborative ways and how we work together and uh, in the AI world is like uh, how can we share the data how can we um, make those developers more smoothly. So, so, uh, so, so first is like uh, um, the the technical is on the hand of the uh, the people who, who who know how to use that. So, so I think that is the beauty of the open source. So, if we can keep it uh, this way, that could be a good way to go. Okay, thanks. Uh, we've already six 
exceed the time for five minutes. So I think we have to continue our questions and conversations in the hallway. And uh, again, thanks everyone for joining this panel, and thanks for our speakers for their for your valuable insights. And um, I think that's all for this. Thank you.